like to share with you two stories. And the first story is about Anand, a local scrap dealer. I live in an apartment in Bangalore. And every Sunday, um, Anand comes into our apartment and sets up this little scrap shop outside our gate. And then he goes to various different households, picks up newspaper, carton boxes, plastic, and he pays the household for this material, brings the waste back to this little scrap shop, and then finally, at the end of the day, all of this waste goes, aggregates, and then gets sold out to a recycler. Now, on the face of it, it may seem like a win for all, but actually it's not a win for Anand. And I, as an entrepreneur, know that because the revenues that he gets from the sale of the scrap will barely meet all his operational costs and will barely give him a slim margin as remuneration for himself. He will also have his wife and his child in the business because he doesn't have to pay them a salary. And even if he could afford an assistant, he would barely be able to pay this assistant fair wages. So in 21st century India, we have to recognize this model for what it is. It is an exploitative model. And just because middle class India wants to be paid for newspapers, we have a system which really encourages social injustice. It encourages children in the system. And it hardly takes care of our waste problem because actually this kind of scrap is barely 2% of the total waste that we generate in our homes or in our offices. My second story is about my journey in waste and my relationship with waste. Um, so I was just out of college in the mid 80s and um, studied German and therefore decided that I would like to be a tour guide and use my language skills. So I traveled through the country with my German tourists, all of us very happy because India is this great country, wonderful uh, art, architecture, people, cuisine. And then there was this defining moment one day in Madurai outside the Minakshi temple. We were all awestruck by this, you know, the, the huge gateways, people, prayers, and all of that. Tourists taking pictures of the temple. And then there was this one tourist who went slightly at the side and started taking pictures of all the waste and the dump and, you know, the ugly sight around it. And then this tourist turned to me and said, what are you as a young person going to do about this side of India. Now this question stayed with me for many years. In fact, it stayed with me for 20 years and it frustrated me because every time I saw garbage, you know, I felt helpless. Finally, when I turned 40, I decided that this is the time for me now. I would want to get into solutions around waste. The trigger for me was also at that time, the municipal solid waste rules which came out just a year before, in 2000. And these municipal solid waste rules from the government of India were very aligned with my ideas of what I wanted to do. It talked of waste as a resource. It talked of each stakeholder, including consumers, actually taking responsibility for their waste. So that for me was the beginning of my journey into actually a solution around waste. And I set up this organization called Sahas. Sahas, in the first few years, we worked as a not-for-profit. Uh, we focused a lot on reduce, which is the first R in waste management. We also did a lot of campaigns around, you know, less plastic. But I knew that the actual, I had to also get into the real solutions. And that meant, um, you know, taking the waste off the streets converting all our waste into resources. Um, so I realized that this solution now needed a business solution. It needed to be more professional. And that for me was then the start of transitioning Sahas, the NGO, to a 
private limited, a social enterprise. And so here we are at Sahas Zero Waste, which I started in 2013, uh, looking to actually bring all waste, whether it had economic value or not, into a resource. Um, and today we have three service lines. Um, the first service line is around creating a zero waste campus. I mean, 40% of all our city's waste comes from what we call bulk generators. So here you have the tech parks, the office complexes, the malls, the educational institutions, and we actually partner with each of these as our customers, and then we convert them into zero waste uh, campuses. Our second service line is around bringing back consumer waste. It could be plastic waste, it could be electronic waste, channeling it through a reverse logistic system so that it doesn't go on our streets, it doesn't go onto the dump site, it gets recycled. And the third service line is our sale of products. Because finally, if we have to not have waste on our streets, the waste should come back in our homes. And by selling these products, we really close the loop, we bring it back into our homes, and we also demonstrate a circular economy. So let me show you what happens in one of our customer locations in Bangalore, and that is the office of Microsoft. They have this big, nice campus uh, in Bangalore, which houses about 3,000 employees and generates about 1.2 tons of waste per day. They've knocked off all these single-use plastics, so you know, there's less waste on campus. They also have a very good segregation system. But what we also have is on campus, a unit which manages all their waste and our team manages that waste. So when the wet waste comes to us, there is a biogas plant on campus and all the food waste is fed into this biodigester. From there we get gas, that gas is then piped into the kitchen and food is cooked there. All the dry waste comes, thank you, all the dry waste comes into the, again into our unit our women do a sorting into paper, plastic, metal, glass. This waste now moves to our material recovery facility, which is our factory for waste. And there we have 20 plus categories of waste in which you know, the materials are sorted. So you will get about six different types of paper, seven different types of plastic. And all of this material is now a resource. All of this material goes, you know, into recycling and we then get paid by our recyclers. But the company also pays us a service fee which meets all our operations. We work like this with several such campuses and we also work with builders like RMZ in Bangalore is a very big builder and we partner with all their campuses to make them zero waste campus. Thank you. So, so today Sahas manages 80 tons of waste per day and we have a team strength of 300. 250 of them, mostly women, are our backbone of our organization. They are our field team and we make sure because we have a service fee that we pay them fair wages. So you have them now move up from you know very low income households to a level of being lower middle class. What is the situation in India? Yeah, it is in India now, we all know the kind of, you know, waste, garbage problems that we have around the country. We have 62 million tons of waste being generated every year, of which just about 70% is actually collected and 20% processed. It's, it's scary, it's frightening, it's a big environment disaster. And why do we have the situation? First of all, no implementation, poor enforcement of the regulations, but also because of our mindsets. Our mindset is such now that we, look, we don't understand or we refuse to recognize the difference between garbage and waste. So whatever brings us economic value, we will 
you know, manage that. But everything else becomes garbage. So food waste, uh, plastic, papers, all just mixed together. And when it's mixed, it can't be fixed. So this is the waste that comes on our streets and which, you know, we throw our hands up in the air. Waste, on the other hand, as we've seen, is a raw material. It's resource. But it takes extreme effort. It takes a lot of operations around conversion of this waste to a resource. It takes investment, it takes technology, it takes people, it takes a business model. And a business model with both a head and a heart. So at Sahas, we've put our heads, at Sahas Zero Waste, we've put our heads together to put a professional team in place, to invest in the right technology, to have accountability for every fraction of waste till at such time it reaches a recycler. And then the heart is in the impact because we're very mindful of all our waste going through the cycle. We're very mindful of our team, especially our field team, being taken care of through at least fair wages. So it's always the head and the heart working together. And that really is the story of waste to wealth. Wealth is really the, you know, the, uh, the kind of resources that we have, the kind of repercussions this brings in terms of environment, cleaner air, cleaner water. Wealth is also the social justice system that we build. Now, if we want to have and if we value this wealth, then together we must also commit collectively to change. And for that to happen, we have to look at adopting and embracing the polluter pays principle. So it's simple. All of us are consumers. And all of us, through our consumption patterns, are also polluters. So therefore today, as we buy that chips packet and as we buy that mobile phone, we also have to pay, and we, as we pay for the product, we also have to pay for its recycling. And only if we do this, will we get bit better business models. Business models working with a head and a heart. Business models so that Anand has the voice to ask for a service fee when he gives us this doorstep service of collecting our newspapers for recycling. At this point, I fondly remember what Nelson Mandela said many, many years ago. He said, when the head and the heart work together, a formidable force is created. Now, I do believe that we are on the brink of creating a formidable force, and it is this force that will give us clean air, water, soil health, social justice, and the ultimate goal of no waste on our planet. Thank you.